Hi, in this video I'm going to show you how we can take a set of experimental results for a kinetics reaction and from them figure out the order of reaction with respect to each reactant. We'll write the rate equation or rate law for the reaction and calculate a value for k the rate constant. And finally I'll share with you a foolproof method for working out the units for k. Let's jump straight in. The first reaction we're going to look at is the decomposition of dinitrogen pentaoxide into nitrogen 4 oxide and oxygen according to the balanced or the stoichiometric equation that we have here. And we've got a set of results for this experiment. In our results table we've got the concentration of the dinitrogen pentaoxide and some values for the initial rate of reaction and the units here moles per decimeter cubed per hour. Before we go any further I'd like you to have a think about how the set of results was actually achieved because the topic of reaction kinetics or rates of reaction at A level is completely dependent on you understanding how the experimental work ties up with the theory. If you haven't got these two things synced in your head then you're going to find this really difficult. So this is a classic experiment where we have taken in this case the dinitrogen pentaoxide and we've taken a concentration of 0.01 mole per decimeter cubed and we have measured the rate of the decomposition. How? Well, there are many ways that you can measure reactions. In this case, maybe by pressure, for example, because we've got a change in the number of moles of gas from reactant to product. The actual details of the experiment are not so important. But what we need to realize is this, this experiment was then repeated twice more. So in this experiment, we are following the concentration of the dinitrogen pentaoxide. And as one would expect, because it's a reactant, over time, the concentration is going to decrease. And we can take measurements to track the change in concentration. And when we plot these on a graph, we can draw a nice smooth line through um, the points, a curve of best fit. The experiment was then repeated this time at a concentration of 0.02 mole per decimeter cubed. Once again, the change in concentration is measured and plotted on a graph. And then finally, we can see the experiment was repeated a third time, this time at a concentration or initial concentration of 0.04 mole per decimeter cubed. For each concentration, we're interested in finding the initial rate of reaction. And that is the rate of reaction when t, the time, equals zero. So this point here. So if we draw a tangent against each of our curves at t equals zero, you can see the pink line here, I've drawn it in for the 0 0.04 mole per decimeter cubed concentration. And we work out the gradient or slope of that line. Remember, that's the change in y over the change in x, that gives us the initial rate of reaction for that particular concentration. And then we would do the same, let me just change my colour here, by drawing a tangent for, that's not very well drawn, for 0 0.02 mole per decimeter cubed and also for 0 0.01. The first thing that we need to figure out from this set of results is the order of reaction with respect to the dinitrogen pentaoxide. If we look at the results of this series, we can see that doubling the concentration, the starting concentration of N2O5 from 0.01 to 0.02 causes the initial rate of reaction to double. And again, if I double the concentration, the starting concentration from 0.2 to 0.04, then the initial rate of reaction doubles from 0.032 to 0.064. So the concentration is proportional to the initial rate of reaction, which means that we can say that this reaction is first order with respect to 
In this case, we've only got one reactant, it being a decomposition reaction, uh, reaction the dinitrogen pentaoxide. If I know the order of reaction, I can write a rate equation. So rate equals K, the rate constant, N2O5. And I could raise that to the power of 1 because it's first order, but generally speaking, we don't actually bother. And since we have experimental results, we can determine a value for K, the rate constant. And to do that, we can use any of these three sets of results. I am going to pick the middle set because why not? So I can rearrange this equation. K, the rate constant, is equal to the rate divided by the concentration of N2O5. So the rate in this case was 0 0.032 mole per decimeter cubed per hour. And the concentration was 0 0.02 mole per decimeter cubed. And when you plug that into your calculator, you get a value for K of 1.6. However, what about the units? Well, we can see here we've got mole per decimeter cubed per hour on the top, mole per decimeter cubed on the bottom. These two concentration units in this particular example are going to cancel out. So the units for K are simply hours to the minus one. We could confirm all this graphically. If we plot a graph of initial rate of reaction against concentration, and I have that right here, we can see that we get a straight line that passes through the origin because the initial rate of reaction is proportional to the concentration of our reactant N2O5. It passes through the origin because, as you'd expect, if we have no concentration in reactant, we're going to have no initial rate of reaction. And in this particular example, because it's first order with respect to our reactant and we only have one reactant, then because we have plotted initial rate of reaction against concentration of N2O5, so here we are, here are my two axes. Then the gradient of this line is K, our rate constant. So if I were to figure out the slope of this line, so change in the Y axis div uh, divided by the change in the X axis. And if I had a ruler, which I don't right now, so change in the y-axis would be this here. And change in the x-axis would be the difference between these two values here. I should come up with my uh, answer of 1.6 hours to the minus 1. And generally speaking, finding a value for k from the gradient of a graph gives us a more accurate measure of K because as we've plotted a graph and put in a line of best fit, that averages out any anomalous data. Moving on to my second example, the reaction between nitrogen 4 oxide and carbon monoxide. In this set of results, the experiment's been done four times. In each case, the starting concentration of NO2 has been changed and we have results for the initial rate of reaction in each case. We can see here that if we double the concentration of NO2, then the initial rate of reaction has quadrupled. Again, if we double the concentration from 0 0.3 to 0 0.6, then the initial rate of reaction quadruples. So this tells me that it is second order, the reaction is second order with respect to 
NO2, the nitrogen 4 oxide. We could write a rate equation for this reaction if we knew what the order of reaction with respect to carbon monoxide was. So let's say the order of reaction is first order with respect to carbon monoxide. In that case, rate would equal K. NO2 square brackets to denote concentration raised to the power of 2 because it's second order with respect to NO2. And I've just decided that it's first order with respect to carbon monoxide. So what would we expect to see if we plotted this set of results on a graph? Well, we would get the first graph here. So this is concentration of NO2 plotted against the initial rate of reaction. And we get a slight curve. It's definitely a curve. However much I squint at it and mess around my ruler, I can't make that a straight line passing through the origin. So that is good evidence that it's not first order with respect to NO2, but second order. How do I confirm that? By plotting a second graph. There are always a lot of graphs in kinetics uh, experiments. In this graph, I've plant, uh, plotted, planted, plotted initial rate of reaction against the concentration of NO2 squared. Doubling the concentration quadruples the rate of reaction. In that case, I do get a straight line that passes through the origin. And this is what I would expect a graph for a second order reactant to look like. Now, we've already determined the rate equation. We said that rate was equal to K. NO2 square brackets raised to the power of 2. CO. So in this case, K is equal to rate divided by NO2 concentration squared. CO. I have plotted rate against the concentration of nitrogen 4 oxide squared, in which case the gradient of this line is going to equal K, our rate constant, multiplied by the concentration of carbon monoxide. And if I wanted a value for K, I would just need to rearrange that equation. So K would equal the gradient of the line, remember that is change in y divided by the change in the x-axis divided by the concentration of carbon monoxide. And in my final example, we're going to look at the reaction between chloromethane and water. This is a hydrolysis reaction and it can be followed by measuring the formation of a product, in this case HCl, hydrogen chloride over time. So what is the order of reaction with respect to the two reactants? We've got chloromethane, we've got water. The first thing I'm going to do is look at experiments one and two, because in experiments one and two, the concentration of water remains the same, which means that it cannot affect the rate of the reaction. Any change in the rate of reaction must be due to the change in the concentration, or the initial starting concentration, of chloromethane. Between experiments 1 and 2, the concentration of chloromethane has increased one and a half times. I know that because I divided 0.0375 by 0.0250. And if I do the same, if I divide 4.256 by 2.838, I find that the initial rate of reaction has also increased one and a half times. So it's proportional. Changing the concentration leads to proportional change in the initial rate of reaction. So we can say that this reaction is first order with respect to the chloromethane. Now let's have a look at how the concentration of water affects the rate of reaction. Well, in this case, I am going to pick experiment one and experiment three because in these two experiments, the starting concentration of chloromethane remains the same, so it can't affect the rate. 
Moving from experiment three to experiment one, I can see that the concentration of water has doubled. And I can see that the initial rate of reaction has quadrupled. So the reaction is second order with respect to water. Writing a rate equation for this reaction, we can say that rate is equal to the rate constant chloromethane. It was first order and second order with respect to water. So square brackets to denote concentration and the concentration of water raised to the power of two. Once again, because I've got a full set of results, I can calculate a value for K, the rate constant. So K is equal to rate divided by the concentration of chloromethane and the concentration of water raised to the power of two. I can take any set of results. Um, I'm going to take the bottom set, in which case the rate was 0 0.709. The units for initial rate of reaction, mole per decimeter cube per second. So I'm just going to put these in per second. And the concentration in experiment three for chloromethane was 0 0.0205. .0 that makes more sense multiplied by the concentration of water, 0.125, and that's squared because it's raised to the power of 2. And when we plug that into our calculator, we get a value of 1815. Now, how do I figure out the units? Well, the units for concentration for my bottom layer are mole per decimeter cubed for the chloromethane. And for the water, it's moles per decimeter cubed squared. So I'm going to put it in twice. Now we can cancel out concentration units from the top layer and one set of concentration units from the bottom layer, which mean my units become S to the minus one divided by mole per decimeter cubed times mole per decimeter cubed. If I put those two together, when you multiply powers, you actually add them. So that becomes s to the minus 1 mole squared dm to the minus 6. Then finally, I'm going to bring the bottom layer up to the top. And when you do that, you reverse the sign on the units that you're moving. So it becomes mole to the minus 2, dm6, s to the minus 1. And then if you are being absolutely correct, you would write your positive units before your negative units. So the actual units should be dm6, mole to the minus 2, s to the minus 1. You have to figure out the units for K for each individual reaction. There's a link in the blurb below to the Crunch Chemistry website where you can find the notes for this video, as well as some excellent practice questions. And if this has been helpful, then please hit the like button, subscribe and share. It makes a huge difference to a channel like us. I look forward to seeing you next time.